Recently, I had the chance to attend Doug Casey's investment conference on When Money Dies. He asked me to speak about the fascist threat in America, and I thought you might like to hear the talk. It's hard to imagine that our next speaker needs much, if any, introduction to everybody in the room, but in case there's a hotel employee in the back who doesn't know who he is, uh, he is the uh, founder and chairman of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Uh, he is the author or editor of six books, including the recent The Left, The Right, and The State. And um, I am a huge, huge fan. His, his energy, his focus, his commitment, his passion, his clarity uh, of his writing and of his speaking, the energy with which the Mises Institute works with students and uh, the resources available. Uh, I often tell people, if you have a question about how freedom works, go to Mises.org. If you can't find the answer there, reframe the question, because it can't be that important. So uh, I'm a huge, huge fan, and uh, it is with great, great honor uh, that I introduce our next speaker. If the future can be saved, and looking at the energy and intelligence in the room here, I think it can be. When the future is saved, it will owe a huge debt of gratitude to one Lou Rockwell. Well, I want to thank Doug Casey and uh, all his wonderful staff for allowing me the honor of uh, talking to this great group which, uh, you know, does, I must say, give me much optimism. But I'm going to talk today, uh, as Doug asked me to do, about whether America is on the path to fascism. I suppose I could sum up my entire talk by just saying, Heil Obama, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <clears throat> now, we all know that the term fascist is a pejorative, often used to describe any political position a speaker doesn't like. There isn't anyone around today who's willing to stand up and say, I'm a fascist. I think fascism is a great economic and political system. But I submit if they were really honest, the vast majority of politicians, intellectuals, and political activists would have to say just that. Fascism is the system of government that cartelizes the private sector, centrally plans the economy to subsidize producers, exalts the police state as the source of order, denies fundamental rights, and liberties to individuals, and makes the executive state the unlimited master of society. This describes mainstream politics in America today. And not just America, it's true in Europe, too. And in fact, it's so much a part of the mainstream, it's hardly noticed anymore. It's true that fascism has no overarching theoretical apparatus. There's no grand theorist like Karl Marx. That makes it no less real and distinct as a social, economic, and political system. Fascism also thrives as a distinct style of social and economic management. And it is much more of a threat to civilization, I would argue, than full-blown socialism. This is because its traits are so much a part of life and have been for so long that they are nearly invisible to us. But if fascism is invisible to us, it is truly the silent killer. It fastens a huge, violent, and lumbering state on the free market that drains capital and productivity like a deadly parasite on a host. The fascist state is the vampire economy. It sucks the economic life out of a nation and brings about a slow death of a once thriving economy. Let me provide a a recent example. Recently, the papers were filled with first sets of data from the U.S. Census in 2010. The headline story concerned the huge increase in the poverty rate largest increase in 20 years, now up to 15%. But most people hear this and dismiss it, probably for good reason. After all, the poor in this country are not poor by any historical standard. They have cell phones, cable TV, cars, lots of food, plenty of disposable income. What's more, there's no such thing as a fixed class called the poor. People come and go depending on age and life circumstances. Plus, in American politics, when we hear kvetching about the poor, everyone knows what you're supposed to do, let the government reach for your wallet again. But buried in the report is another fact with much more profound significance. It concerns the median family income in real terms. What the data have revealed this year is devastating. Since 1999, median household income has fallen 7.1%. Since 1989, median family income is largely flat. And since the end of the gold standard, it has hardly risen at all. The great wealth generating machine that was once America is failing. No longer can one generation expect to live a better life than the previous one. The fascist economic model has killed what was once called the American dream. And the truth is, of course, even worse than these statistics reveal. 
for we have to consider how many incomes exist within a single household to make up the total income. After World War II, with the massive and magnificent uh, cut in government income and in the, in the government military, the single family income became the norm. But then the money was destroyed, and American savings harmed, and the capital base of the economy devastated. It was at this point that households began to struggle to stay above water. The year 1985 was the turning point. This was the year when it became more common for a household to have two incomes than one. Mothers entered the workforce to keep family incomes floating. Now, the intellectuals cheered this trend as if it represented liberation, shouting hosannas that all women everywhere were now added to the tax rolls as valuable contributors to the coffers of the state. The real cause was the rise of fiat money that depreciated the currency, robbed savings, and shoved people into the workforce as taxpayers. This story is not told in the data alone. We have to look at the demographics to discover it. The huge demographic shift essentially brought American households another 20 years of seeming prosperity, though it's hard to call it that since there was no longer any choice about the matter. If you wanted to keep living the dream, the household could no longer get by on a single income. But this huge shift was merely an escape hatch. It brought 20 years of slight increases, but then the income trend flattened again. Over the last decade, we are back to failing and falling. Today, median family income is only slightly above where it was when Nixon wrecked the dollar, put on price and wage controls, created the EPA and many other federal agencies, and the whole apparatus of the parasitic welfare warfare state came to be entrenched and made universal. Yes, this is fascism, and we are paying the price. The dream is being destroyed. To talk in Washington about reform, whether from Democrats or Republicans, is a bad joke. They talk of small changes, small cuts, commissions they will establish, curbs they will make in the future. It's all white noise, of course. None of this will fix the problem, not even close. The problem is more fundamental. It is the quality of the money. It is the very existence of thousands of regulatory agencies. It is the whole assumption that you have to pay the state for the privilege to work. It is the presumption that the government must manage every aspect of the capitalist economic order. In short, it is the total state that is the problem, and the suffering and decline will continue so long as the total state exists. To be sure, the last time anyone worried about fascism was during the Second World War. We were said to be fighting this evil system abroad. The U.S. defeated fascist governments, but the philosophy of governance that it represented was not defeated. Very quickly following that war, another one broke out. This was the Cold War that pitted capitalism against communism. Socialism, in this case, was considered to be a soft form of, of communism, tolerable and even praiseworthy insofar as it was linked with democracy, the system that legalizes and legitimizes the ongoing pillaging of the population. In the meantime, almost everyone had forgotten there are other colors of socialism, not all of them obviously left-wing. Fascism is one of these colors. There can be no question about its origins. It's tied up with the history of post-World War I Italian politics. In 1922, Benito Mussolini won a democratic election and established fascism as his philosophy. Mussolini had been a member of the Socialist Party. All the biggest and most important players within the fascist movement came from the socialists. Fascism was a threat to the socialists because it was the most appealing political vehicle for the real-world application of the socialist impulse. Socialists crossed over to join the fascists en masse. This is also why Mussolini himself enjoyed such good press for more than 10 years after his rule began. He was celebrated in article after article in the New York Times. He was heralded in scholarly collections as an exemplar of the type of leader we need in the age of the planned society. Puff pieces on this blowhard were common in U.S. journalism all throughout the late 1920s and up until the mid-1930s. In this same period, the American left went through a huge shift. In the teens and 20s, at least aspects of the left had had a praiseworthy anti-corporatist impulse. They generally opposed war, the state-run penal system, alcohol prohibition, violations of civil liberties. Obviously no friend to capitalism, but neither was the left friend to the corporate state of the sort that FDR forged during the New Deal. In 1933 and 1934, the American left had to make a choice. Would they embrace the corporatism and regimentation of the New Deal, or take a principal stand based on some of their old liberal values? In other words, would they accept fascism 
as a halfway house to their socialist utopia. A battle ensued in the period, and there was a clear winner. The New Deal made an offer the left could not refuse. And it was a small step to go from the embrace of the fascistic planned economy to the celebration of the warfare state that concluded the New Deal period. This was merely a repeat of the same course of events in Italy a decade earlier. In Italy, too, the left realized that their anti-capitalistic agenda could best be achieved within the framework of the authoritarian planning state. Of course, our friend John Maynard Keynes was playing a critical role in providing a pseudo-scientific rationale for joining opposition to old world laissez-faire to a new appreciation of the planned society. Recall that Keynes was not a socialist of the old school. As he himself said in the introduction to the Nazi edition of general theory, national socialism is far more hospitable to his ideas than a market economy. The most definitive study on fascism written in these years was As We Go Marching by John T. Flynn. Flynn was a great journalist and a scholar of the liberal spirit who had a lot of best-selling books in the 1920s, probably could be best considered a progressive in those days. But it was the New Deal that changed him. His colleagues all followed FDR into fascism, where Flynn kept the old faith. That meant he fought FDR every step of the way, and not only on his domestic plans. Flynn was a leader of the America First movement that saw FDR's drive to war as nothing but an extension of the New Deal, which it certainly was. But because Flynn was part of what Murray Rothbard later called the old right, he came to oppose, that is, both the welfare state and the warfare state. His name went down the Orwellian memory hole after the war, when American conservatives decided to copy FDR. As We Go Marching came out in 1944, just at the end of the war, and right in the midst of wartime economic controls the world over. It's a wonder it got past the censors. In a full-scale study of fascist theory and practice, he saw precisely where fascism ends, using militarism and war as the fulfillment of stimulus spending. When you run out of everything else to spend money on, you can always depend on nationalist fervor to back more military spending. In reviewing the history of the rise of fascism, Flynn wrote, quote, one of the most baffling phenomena of fascism is the almost incredible collaboration between men of the extreme right and men of the extreme left in its creation. The explanation lies at this point. Both right and left, he said, joined in this urge for regulation. The motives, the arguments, the forms of expression were different, but all drove in the same direction. And this was that, that the economic system must be controlled in its essential functions, and this control must be exercised by the producing groups." Unquote. Flynn writes that the left and the right disagree on precisely who fits the bill as the producing group. The left tends to celebrate laborers as producers. The right tends to celebrate business owners as producers. The political compromise, then as now, was to cartelize both. Government under fascism becomes the cartelization device for both workers and the private owners of capital. Competition between workers and between businesses is regarded as wasteful and pointless. The political elites decide the members of these groups need to get together and cooperate under government supervision to build a mighty nation. The fascists have always been obsessed with the idea of national greatness. To them, this does not consist in a nation of people who are growing more prosperous, living ever better and longer lives. No national greatness occurs when the state itself embarks on gigantic programs to build huge national monuments, undertake nationwide programs like building transportation systems, carving Mount Rushmore, digging the Panama Canal, and so forth. In other words, national greatness is not the same thing as your greatness, or your family's greatness, or your company's greatness. On the contrary, you have to be taxed. Your money's value has to be depreciated, your privacy invaded, and your well-being diminished in order to achieve. In this view, the government has to make us great. Tragically, such a program has a far greater chance of political success than old-fashioned socialism. Fascism doesn't nationalize private property as socialism does. That means that the economy doesn't collapse right away. Nor does fascism push to equalize incomes. There's no longer any talk of the abolition of marriage or the nationalization of children. Religion is not abolished, but rather used as a tool of political manipulation. The fascist state was far more politically astute in this than communism. It wove together religion and statism into one package, encouraging a worship of God so long as the state was seen as the intermediary. Under fascism, society as we know it is left intact though everything is lorded over by a mighty state apparatus. 
Whereas traditional socialist teaching fostered a globalist perspective, fascism was explicitly nationalist. It embraced and exalted the idea of the nation state. As for the bourgeoisie, fascism doesn't seek their expropriation. Instead, the middle class gets what it wants in the form of social insurance, medical benefits, and heavy doses of national pride. It is for all these reasons that fascism takes on a right-wing caste. It doesn't attack fundamental bourgeois values. It draws on them to garner support for a democratically backed, all-around national regimentation of economic control, censorship, cartelization, political intolerance, geographic expansion, executive control, the police state, and militarism. For my part, I have no problem seeing the fascist program as a right-wing one, even though it does fulfill aspects of the left-wing dream. The crucial matter here concerns its appeal to the public and to the demographic groups that are normally drawn to right-wing politics. If you think about it, right-wing statism is of a different color, cast, and tone from left-wing statism. Each is designed to appeal to a different set of voters with different interests and values. These divisions, however, are not strict, and we've already seen how a left-wing socialist program can adapt itself and become a right-wing fascist program with very little substantive change other than its marketing program. John T. Flynn was disgusted by the irony that what he saw most everyone else chose to ignore, that in the fight against authoritarian regimes abroad, the U.S. adopted these forms of government at home complete with price control, rationing, censorship, executive dictatorship, and even concentration camps for whole groups considered to be unreliable in their loyalties to the state. After reviewing a long history, Flynn proceeds to sum up with eight points that he considers to be the marks of the fascist state. As I present them, I'll also offer comments on the, the modern American version. Point one, the government is totalitarian because it acknowledges no restraint on its powers. It's a very telling mark suggests the U.S. political system can be described as totalitarian. This is a shocking remark to most people, but they can reject this characterization so long as they happen not to be directly ensnared in the state's web. If they become so, they will quickly discover there are indeed no limits to what the state can do. This can happen to you boarding a flight, driving around your hometown, or having your business run afoul of some government agency. In the end, you must obey or be caged like an animal. In this way, no matter how much we may believe we are free, all of us are potentially one step from Guantanamo. As recently as the 1990s, I can recall that there were moments when even Clinton seemed to acknowledge there were some things that his administration could not do. Today, I'm not so sure that I can recall any government official ever pleading the constraints of law or the constraints of reality as to what government can and cannot do. No aspect of life is left untouched by government intervention, and it often takes forms we do not readily see. We know that all of so-called health care is regulated, but so is every bit of our food, transportation, clothing, household products, even private relationships. Mussolini himself put the principle this way, quote, all within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. He also said the keystone of the fascist doctrine is its conception of the state, of its essence, its functions, and its aims. For fascism, the state is absolute, individuals and groups relative. I submit to you that this is the prevailing ideology in the United States today. This nation, conceived in liberty, has been kidnapped by the fascist state. Point two, government is a de facto dictatorship based on the leadership principle. I wouldn't say that we truly have a dictatorship of one man in this country, although we do have a form of dictatorship of one sector of government over the entire country. The executive branch has spread so dramatically over the last century that it has become a joke to speak of checks and balances. What the kids learn in civics class has nothing to do with reality. The executive state is the state as we know it, all flowing from the White House on down. The role of the courts is to enforce the will of the executive. The role of the legislature is to ratify the policy of the executive. Further, this executive is not really about the person who seems to be in charge. The president is only the veneer, and the elections only the tribal rituals we undergo to confer some legitimacy on the institution. In reality, the nation state lives and thrives outside any democratic mandate. Here we find the power to regulate all aspects of life and the wicked power to create the money necessary to fuel this executive rule. As for the leadership principle, there is no greater lie in American public life than the propaganda we hear every four years about how the new president, Messiah, is going to usher in the great dispensation of peace equality, liberty, general human happiness. 
The idea here is that the whole of society is really shaped and controlled by a single will, a point that requires a leap of faith so vast that you have to disregard everything you know about reality to believe it. And yet people do. The hope for a messiah reached a fevered pitch with Obama's election. The civic religion was in full-scale worship mode of the greatest human being who ever lived or ever shall live. What a despicable display. Another lie that the American people believe is that the presidential elections bring about regime change. This is sheer nonsense. The Obama state is the Bush state. The Bush state was the Clinton state. The Clinton state was the Bush state. The Bush state was the Reagan state. We can trace this back and back in time and see the overlapping appointments, bureaucrats, technicians, diplomats, Fed officials, financial elites, and so forth. Rotation in office occurs not because of election, but because of mortality. Point three, government administers a capitalist system with an immense bureaucracy. The reality of our bureaucratic administration has been with us at least since the New Deal, which was modeled on the planning bureaucracy that lived during World War I. The planned economy, rather than Mussolini's or ours, requires bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is the heart, lungs, and veins of the planning state. And yet to regulate any economy as thoroughly as this one today is regulated is to kill prosperity with a billion tiny cuts. This doesn't necessarily mean negative economic growth right away. It certainly means killing off growth that would otherwise have occurred in a free market. Where is our growth? Where is the peace dividend that was supposed to come after the end of cold, the Cold War? Where are the fruits of the amazing gains in efficiency that technology has afforded us? It's all been eaten by the bureaucracy that manages our every move on Earth. The voracious and insatiable monster, here we might call the federal code, that calls on thousands of agencies to exercise the police power to prevent us from living free lives. It is as Bastiat said, and Hazlitt too, the real cost of the state is in the prosperity we do not see, the jobs that don't exist, the technologies to which we do not have access, the businesses that do not come into existence, and the bright future that is stolen from us. The state has looted us just as surely as a robber who enters our home at night and steals all that we love. Point four, producers are organized into cartels in the way of syndicalism. Now, syndicalism is not normally how we think about our current economic structure. But remember that syndicalism means economic control by the producers. Capitalism is different. It places by virtue of market structures, all control in the hands of consumers. The only question for syndicalists, then, is which producers are going to enjoy political privilege. It might be the workers, but it could also be the largest corporations. In the case of the U.S., if we just think of the last three years, we've seen giant banks, pharmaceutical firms, insurance companies, car companies, Wall Street houses, and quasi-private mortgage companies enjoy vast privileges at our expense. This is also an expression of the syndicalist idea, and it has cost the U.S. economy untold trillions and sustained an economic depression by preventing the post-boom adjustments the market would otherwise have dictated. The government has tightened its syndicalist grip on all of us in the name of stimulus. Point five, economic planning is based on the principle of autarky. Autarky is the name given to the idea of economic self-sufficiency. Mostly this refers to the economic self-determination of the nation state. The nation state must be geographically huge in order to support rapid economic growth for a large and growing population. This was and is the basis of fascist expansionism. Without expansion, fascists believe the state dies. It is also the idea behind the strange combination of protectionist pressures today combined with militarism. It's driven in part by the need to control resources. Look at the wars in Iraq. Afghanistan and Libya, just to mention three of them, we would be supremely naive to believe that these wars were not motivated in part by the producer interests of the oil industry. It is true of the American empire in general and its drive to support dollar hegemony. It's the reason for the planned North American Union. The goal is national self-sufficiency rather than a world of peaceful trade. Consider, too, the protectionist impulses of the Republican ticket. There is not one single Republican, apart from Ron Paul, who authentically supports free trade in the classical definition. From ancient Rome to modern-day America, imperialism is a form of statism that the bourgeoisie love. It was this reason that Bush's post-9-11 push for global empire has been sold as patriotism and love of country, rather than for what it clearly is, the looting of liberty and property to benefit the political elites. Six, government sustains economic life through spending and borrowing. This point hardly requires elaboration because it's no longer hidden. There was stimulus one, stimulus two, both of which were so discredited that stimulus three will have to adopt a new name, let's call it 
the American Jobs Act. With a primetime speech, Obama argued in favor of this program with some of the most asinine economic analysis I have ever heard. He mused about how it is that people are unemployed at a time when schools, bridges, and infrastructure need repairing. He demanded that supply and demand come together to match up needed work with jobs. Hello? The schools, bridges, and infrastructure that Obama refers to are all built and maintained by government. That's why they're falling apart. <laughs> and people can't have jobs because the government has made it too expensive to hire them. It's not complicated. Sit around and dream of other scenarios is no different from wishing that water flowed uphill or rocks floated in the air. It amounts to a denial of reality. Still, Obama went on invoking the old fascistic longing for national greatness. Quote, building a world-class transportation system, he said, is part of what made us an economic superpower. Then he asked, we're going to sit back and let China build newer airports and faster railroads? Well, the answer is yes. And you know what? It doesn't hurt a single American for a person in China to travel on a faster railroad than we have. To claim otherwise is simply an incitement to nationalist hysteria. As for the rest of this program, Obama promised yet, of course, another long list of spending programs. Let's just mention the reality. No government in the history of the world has spent as much, borrowed as much, and created as much fake money as the U.S. But none of this would be possible but for the role of the Federal Reserve, the great lender to the world. This institution is absolutely critical to U.S. fiscal policy. There is no way that the national debt could increase at a rate of more than $4 billion a day without this institution. Under a gold standard, all of this maniacal spending would come to an end. And if U.S. debt were priced on the market with a default premium, you'd be looking at a lot lower rating than A+. Point seven, militarism is a mainstay of government spending. You ever notice that the military budget is never seriously discussed in any policy debate? The U.S. spends more than the most of the world combined. And yet to hear our leaders talk, the U.S. is just a tiny commercial republic that wants peace but is constantly threatened by the rest of the world. They would have us believe that we all stand naked and vulnerable. Of course, the whole thing is a ghastly lie. The U.S. is a global military empire, the biggest in the history of the world, and the main threat to peace around the world today. To visualize U.S. military spending as compared with other countries is truly shocking. One bar chart you can easily find online shows the trillion-dollar-plus U.S. military budget as a skyscraper surrounded by tiny huts. And the next highest spender, China, spends less than 10% of what the U.S. does. Where is the debate about this policy? Where is the discussion? Of course, it's not going on. It's just assumed by both parties that it's essential for the U.S. way of life, that the U.S. be the most deadly country on the planet, threatening everyone with nuclear extinction unless they obey. This should be considered a physical and moral outrage by every civilized person. Even Mussolini might not have gone along with this level of military spending. But it's not only about the armed forces and the CIA and other death squads. It's also about police at all levels and their military-like postures. This goes for the local police, the state police, even the crossing guards in our communities. The commissar mentality, the trigger-happy thuggishness has become the norm throughout the whole of society. If you want to witness outrages, it's not hard. Just come into the country through Canada or Mexico. See the bulletproof vest jack-booted thugs running their dogs up and down lanes, searching people randomly, harassing innocents, asking questions that are none of their business. You get the strong impression you might be entering a police state, because the impression would be correct. Yet for the man in the street, the answer to all social problems seems to be more jails, longer terms, more enforcement, more arbitrary power, more crackdowns, more authority, more capital punishment. Where does all of this end? And will the end come before we realize what has happened to our once free country? Point eight, military spending has imperialist aims. Ronald Reagan used to claim that his military buildup was essential to keeping the peace. The history of U.S. foreign policy just since the 80s has shown that this is wrong. We've had one war after another, wars raged by the U.S. against non-compliant countries and the creation of ever more client states and colonies. Our military strength has not led to peace, but to the opposite. It has caused most people in the world to regard the U.S. as a threat and it has led to unconscionable wars on so many countries. We forget that at Nuremberg, the first crime against humanity was defined as waging a war of aggression. Obama, of course, was supposed to end this. His supporters all believed that he would. Instead, of course, he's done the opposite. He's increased troop levels, entrenched wars, started new ones. In reality, he's presided over a warfare state as vicious as any in history. The difference this time is the left is no longer criticizing the U.S. role in the world. 
In that sense, Obama may be the best thing ever to happen to the warmongers and the military-industrial complex. As for the right in this country, it once opposed this kind of military fascism. But all that changed after the beginning of the war, the Cold War. The right was led into a terrible ideological shift, well documented in Murray and Rothbard's neglected masterpiece, The Betrayal of the American Right. In the name of stopping communism, the right came to follow ex-CIA agent Bill Buckley's endorsement of a, quote, totalitarian bureaucracy within our shores, unquote, to fight wars all over the world. At the end of the Cold War, there was a brief reprise when some in the right in this country remembered its roots in non-interventionism, but this did not last long. George Bush I rekindled the militarist spirit with his first war in Iraq, and there's been no fundamental questioning of the American empire ever since. Even today, Republicans elicit their biggest applause by whipping up audiences about foreign threats, never mentioning the real threat to American well-being that exists right in the beltway. I can think of no greater priority today than a serious and effective anti-fascist alliance. In many ways, one is already forming. It's not a formal alliance. It is made up of those who protest the Fed, those who refuse to go along with mainstream fascist politics, those who seek decentralization, those who demand lower taxes and free trade, those who seek the right to associate with whomever they want and to disassociate from whomever they want, those who seek the right to buy and sell in terms of their own choosing, those who educate their children on their own, the investors and savers who make economic growth possible, those who do not want to be felt up at airports, and those who have become expatriates. It's also made up of the millions of independent entrepreneurs who are discovering that the number one threat to their ability to serve others through the commercial marketplace is the institution that claims to be our biggest benefactor, the government. How many people fall into this category? I think more than we know. The movement is intellectual. It is political. It is cultural. It is ideological. They come from all classes, races, countries, and professions. It's no longer a national movement. It is truly global. We can no longer predict where their members consider themselves to be left-wing, right-wing, independent, libertarian, anarchist, or something else. It includes those as diverse as homeschooling parents in the suburbs, as well as parents in urban areas whose children are among the 2.3 million people who languish in jail for no good reason in a country with the largest prison population in the world. And what does this movement want? Nothing more than sweet liberty. It does not ask that liberty be granted or given. It only asks for the liberty of that is promised by life itself and would otherwise exist were it not for the Leviathan state that robs us, badgers us, jails us, kills us. This movement is not departing. We are daily surrounded by evidence that it is right and true. Every day it is more and more obvious that the state contributes absolutely nothing to our well-being, but instead, of course, massively subtracts from it. Back in the 1930s and even up through the 1980s, the partisans of the state were overflowing with ideas. They had theories and agendas that had many intellectual backers. They were thrilled and excited about the world they would create. They would end business cycles, bring about social advance, build the middle class, cure disease, bring about universal security, and much more. Fascism believed in itself. I think this is no longer true. Just as communism lost the belief in itself, I would argue that fascism has lost belief in itself. It has no new ideas, no big projects, not even its partisans really believe it can accomplish what it sets out to do. The world created by the private sector is so much more useful and beautiful than anything the state has ever done that the fascists themselves have become demoralized and aware that their agenda has no real intellectual foundation. It is ever more widely known that statism does not and cannot work. Statism is the great lie. Statism gives us the exact opposite of what it promises. It promises security, prosperity, and peace. It gives us fear, poverty, war, and death. If we want a future, it is one we have to build ourselves. The fascist state will not give it to us. On the contrary, it stands in the way. I've also realized something else. The old-time romance of the classical liberals with the idea of the limited state may be gone. It's far more likely today that young people embrace the idea that 50 years ago was thought to be unthinkable, the idea that society is best off without any state at all. I would mark the rise of anarcho-capitalist theory as the most dramatic intellectual shift in my adult lifetime. Gone is the view of the state as the night watchman who would only guard our essential rights, adjudicate supports, and protect liberty. This view is woefully naive. The night watchman is the guy with the guns, the legal right to use aggression, the guy who controls all comings and goings, the guy who is perched on top and sees all things. Who's watching him? Who's limiting his power? 
No one, and this is precisely the very source of society's greatest ills. No constitution, no election, no social contract will check his power. Indeed, the night watchman has acquired total power. It is he who would be the total state, which Flynn described as a government that, quote, possesses the power to enact any law or take any measure that seems proper to it. So long as government, he says, is closed with the power to do anything without any limitation on its powers, it is totalitarian, it has total power. This is no longer a point that we can ignore. The powers that the night watchman has assumed are not something that we can leave to cocktail parties or scholarly seminars. The night watchman must be removed and his power is distributed within and among a whole population, and they should be governed by the same forces that bring us all the blessings the material world affords us. In the end, this is the choice we face, the total state or total freedom. Which will we choose? If we choose the state, we will continue to sink further and further and eventually lose all we treasure as a civilization. If we choose freedom, we can harness the remarkable power of human cooperation that will enable us to continue to make a better world. In the fight against fascism, there is no reason to be despairing, but rather to continue to fight with every bit of confidence that the future belongs to us and not to them. Their world is falling apart. Ours is just being built. Their world is based on bankrupt ideologies. Ours is rooted in the truth about freedom and reality. Their world can only look back to the glory days. Ours looks forward to a future we are building ourselves. Their world is rooted in the corpse of the nation state. Our world draws on the energies and creativity of all peoples in the world, united in the great and noble project of creating a prospering civilization through peaceful human cooperation. It's true they have the biggest guns, but big guns do not assure permanent victory as they're fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, among other places on the planet. We, on the other hand, possess the only weapon that is truly immortal, the right idea, and this is what can lead us to victory. Mises may have said it best, quote, in the long run, even the most despotic governments, with all their brutality and cruelty, are no match for ideas. Eventually, the ideology that has won the support of the majority will prevail and cut the ground out from under the tyrant's feet. Then the oppressed many will rise in rebellion and overthrow their masters. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for listening to The Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the upper right-hand corner of the LRC front page. Thank you. Thank you.